Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break and got to see some of the exhibit booths and uh, meet with one another. Uh, so now it's my great pleasure to welcome our next panel and to introduce our moderator. Amy Joyce has been with the Washington Post for the past 22 years, first as a reporter in the business section, then as deputy editor of the weekend section, and now as editor and writer for On Parenting, which tackles the challenges, delights, and shared experiences of being a modern parent. Amy, thank you so much for being with us today. I know you have a wonderful panel, uh, so over to you. All right. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited, uh, both as a parent and as a, an editor and, and writer for On Parenting. We have uh, so much ground to cover today, so I'm not going to take too long here, but I'm just very excited about this amazing panel. Um, and I'm just gonna start by letting everybody introduce themselves, take about 60 seconds and tell everyone who you are and uh, what you do. So glad to have you all here. Tessie, why don't we start with you? <laughs> why did I think, why did I know you were gonna start with You're me? right next to me, so. <laughs> Great, so I'm Tessie Ojo and I'm the Chief Executive of the Diana Awards, a charity legacy to Princess Diana based in the UK. Our work is predominantly focused on empowering young people to thrive and really helping take away the barriers that young people face um, that prevents them for, for, from thriving. I kind of sum it up into three things. One is about building resilient young adults, developing young leaders and build, helping young people build social equity and um, that again, that allows them to thrive. It's a pleasure to be here and I know I'm in good company with everybody here. Great. Lenore. I just hop in being next to having to follow that accent is tough, uh, <laughs> Tessie. So here I am, a plain old uh, New Yorker. My name is Lenore. I'm trying to get into my little square here, which is the opposite of the way I think I should be going. There. Oh, my God. Um, go to Catherine and I'll figure out where I am. There. All right, you got me. Uh, it's backwards um, as opposed to my usual Zoom. So what did I do? I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone a million years ago. I wrote a column about it because I used to be a newspaper columnist. And uh, two days later, I was on every possible talk show defending myself, got the nickname America's Worst Mom. Uh, you can look it up. Um, and from there, I started a blog and then wrote a book called Free Range Kids, which I consider sort of a movement towards childhood independence. And now I'm the head of a nonprofit called Let Grow, which is trying to change behavior, make it really easy, normal, and legal to give our kids more independence and build, as Tessie says, resilience. And I made my square. I made my square. You yeah. did it. All right. Catherine. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am a clinical psychologist, a researcher affiliated until very recently with Harvard Med for about 25, 30 years, uh, an author, a consultant. And I guess I would say that my work in the world focuses around one central mission, and that's to make sure that today's children, our children, have not just the technological tools they need as they inherit this world with AI and the pandemic, but also the tools of our humanity the empathy, the ethics, the social emotional intelligence, the DEI competencies that they're gonna to need to survive and thrive in this very interconnected and ever changing world. So I wrote a book called The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age. And since the book came out in 2013, I basically, until the airport shut down, spent all my time between September and May working with kids, parents, and educators, teachers in schools around the world and helping folks really maximize the best practices with technology and minimize the psychological, social, neurological risks. Wonderful. All right. And Pat. Yes. Hi, I'm Pat Vance, a fellow New Yorker, Lenore. Yes. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm president of the Entertainment Software Rating Board. We're best known for the age and content ratings that we assign to video games and mobile apps. Um, we also have a robust uh, enforcement and, and compliance operation in terms of how video game publishers are marketing their product. Uh, we work with retailers to make sure that kids can't purchase uh, a mature rated video game without a parent present. And we also were one of the first COPPA Safe Harbor programs. So we're in 
we, we work with uh, a, a number of companies, both video game companies and toy companies and, and other types of companies who have products directed towards kids to make sure that they're complying with privacy regulations around the world, but also um, employing best practices that are compliant with our program requirements. So we, we span a lot of different, different areas, but that's what the ESRB does. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all very much. Um, Pat, since you were the last one to go, why don't we start with you? I feel like um, the one of the many elephants in the room these days. Uh, I have 13 year old and 11 year old boys. They are spending so much time on their screens, um, but also they're learning from home. They're doing remote school full time. They miss their friends. So they are relying on video games a lot to connect with their friends and, and you know communicate with them. And sometimes it's hysterical. My older one came upstairs one day from playing video games and was talking about a Supreme Court decision he and his friends were discussing. So I see the positives there too, um, but also it's a challenge. I'm sort of tearing my hair out all the time and I think a lot of parents are. So with so much time spent at home now in front of screens and many of the kids finding their only social outlet to be video games, what should parents be watching for when it comes to video games and how do they keep their children safe? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Amy. Thank you. Uh, I mean, look, look. First, relax. Uh, games have, particularly during the pandemic, but other times as well, games do provide the ability to socially connect and to release stress. Um, and there are other benefits as well: problem solving, strategic thinking skills, teamwork, etc., that do engage kids in a different way than other types of screen time. Um, our research is indicating that parents are a little bit more flexible these days uh, due to the pandemic and all of this time at home uh, when it comes to screen time. And, and that's okay. Um, I think one of the things that I always tell parents to do to make sure that the game experience that their children are having is a positive one is to make sure that, the, uh, that games aren't stigmatized in the home. Um, you know, it's really important to keep that door open, to keep that dialogue going, make sure that you understand what your kids are playing, that it's sort of a fun experience. Even, you know, we always encourage parents to play with them, make it into a family activity so that you really understand what your child is doing um, and what they're interested in and why. Um, so keeping that door open, not stigmatizing, setting household rules. We heard at the, at the last panel um, that look, virtually all parents have set household rules. We find that in our own research as well and that they're enforcing those rules. Um, and then when you're not around, because we know parents are stretched really thin, um, parental controls come in very handy. Uh, particularly in the gaming world when it comes to blocking by age rating or blocking spending, limiting spending uh, in the event that your child wants to spend any money on games or in game. Um, and, and also when it comes to screen time, um, the game controls uh, across all the consoles are really robust and very effective. They also enable you to restrict online communication. Um, so, so we, there's a lot of tools available. Parental controls are also in-game tools so that kids can block, mute, and report other players who are harassing them. Um, look, you know, so just like on the playground in the real world, um, there are bullies online and, and there are people who are gonna be harassing or you know, there's a lot of trash talk in games and that can make kids uncomfortable. So make sure that you set your household rules about who your child can play with, um, make sure that you're familiar with the parental controls, which give you that extra oomph in terms of enforcing those rules. Um, don't let your child lie about their age. There are protections in place that prevent things like the sharing of personal information um, and other types of controls in terms of uh, marketing of product to kids to make sure that, the, again, when they're setting up those systems or registering for a new game, that they put in their correct birth date. So that's just sort of the tip of the, the iceberg, but, but that's what I would tell parents to do. Hey, that's great. That's great. Now, with all of that in mind, Lenore, um, <laughs> here you are. I'm going to put you on the spot. In my square. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, when it comes to your new organization, Let Grow, how do we let our children grow when they are on screens now in this whole new world, the way things are? Um, you know, they're, they're socially distant. 
they might not be, we might not be able to throw our nine-year-old on the, the subway these days. So um, you must. how are you, <laughs> how is your philosophy playing into our current environment? Sure. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I pretty much agree with Pat that it is um, a great idea to relax and to recognize that if kids can't meet outside, at least they have a place to meet. I'm so grateful, um, not only that they have games, but that they have um, media with which to talk to each other, just like we're talking now. Uh, we did a survey of 1,600 kids at the uh, sort of towards the beginning of the pandemic, and we asked them, um, what new thing are you learning just for fun? Not for school, not for remote learning, you know, not for a grade. And I'm just gonna read you a couple of things. I'm learning how to draw a SpongeBob, how to put on a door handle, how to start an ant farm, teaching myself Japanese, learning about old West trappers, who's doing that? Um, and somebody else who was learning about 1940s gangsters and researching them. And all I would say to parents is that first of all, most of that information came from your, you know, your kid's screen at some point, if they're look, talking about 1940s trappers, it's probably not a big thing in your <laughs> library at home. It's probably from YouTube. And that's great. I mean, if we had the, the libraries of Alexandria at our disposal 2000 years ago, we'd be grateful. And what we have here is YouTube. Kids are learning things. The idea that every time they're on a screen, their brains are rotting and they're at, um, in danger of being groomed is really just thinking about the very worst case scenario. And there's so much good going on. It's hard to recognize that when something is enjoyable, fun, and self-directed for kids, that is learning, but that is learning. So yeah, there's some worries and you don't want them on 24 hours a day, but when they're on a screen and they're learning something new and they're excited, they're learning Japanese or guitar, hooray. Right, right, great. So Catherine and Tessie, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the social emotional aspect of all of this. Catherine, um, in this whole new world, kids are facing so much that no generation of children have ever faced before. Um, they miss their friends, they miss connecting with teachers. Um, so what are they facing and how can we as parents help them adjust right now? Well, depending on their circumstances, they're facing very different things. You know, that some kids are really living with acute grief and some kids are living with this ambiguous sense of grief, like life as I know it is just not happening. Um, and I think that one of the opportunities now, in addition to learning guitar and Japanese, is, and keeping with the theme of this conference, is that kids are going to learn and develop resilience in ways they might not have previously. And the thing about resilience that's really interesting is that um, kids aren't born resilient, but we can teach them to become resilient. And one of the most important things that home has always done for children, but now especially needs to do, is really help them with self-regulation, with understanding their own emotions, with understanding, you know, you can't control the pandemic, you can't control whether you're going to school today or you're not going to school today, but you can control how you react and you control your emotions. So one of the most important things I would say to parents is worry less about what your kids are doing on screens and check in with how it makes them feel and help them become aware of after you play that game, you seem really grumpy or you seem so happy, who are you just hanging out with? That's so good. But really what we want to be doing socially and emotionally for kids right now in terms of developing resilience is increasing their flexibility, helping them adapt to really scary things that they've never had to adapt to before, helping them really um, feel in control in ways they are capable of being in control. But the most important thing to be able to help our kids do that is that we have to really be optimistic. When you look at the research on who, like who thrived in the blitz, <laughs> and tell well, me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but when we look at the research on how kids thrive in very challenging situations, the number one thing that always comes out is that they had a calm, optimistic adult who was consistently caring for them. And that is just the opposite of overparenting, worrying that they're falling behind academically, worrying they're rotting their brains on screens. But really, you know, this is hard. You can do it, honey. Have you checked in with your friends? And also the other thing I would say when it comes to technology right now is it is the playground. They need to socialize. But they also need to practice what in school, you know, in school I work in, we call like tech health. 
tech health and well-being. So, you know, not only how do you manage your own brain on tech, you know, when you're feeling that strain, when you're having tech fog, we have to teach kids this, but also teach them how to live a healthy life in a pandemic on and off their screens. So I think there's actually a lot we can do. Wonderful, great. I can't wait to talk more about that. Tessie, um, along those lines, how can we help build compassionate young people who look mm -hmm. out for each other, even though they are spending so many hours on screens? How can we sort of help them become all that they can be, those kind, compassionate kids? Absolutely. Just, I think just following on from what Catherine said, to me, there are two core things that we should be doing as parents, as society. Firstly, is investing in our core values. You know, whilst it's so tempting right now for us as parents, schools, institutions, to focus largely on the academia, focusing on what our children are missing out in terms of academia, I believe that what we should really be focusing right now is those core values that underpin a healthy and good society. You know, the core values of kindness, compassion, empathy, respect. You know, those, for me, I, I feel like we have an opportunity as a society as a whole to, put, to press the reset button. Mm -hmm. Some of these values are values that we have lost as society that we, we think doesn't matter, but but candidly, those values are what underpins a great society. And you know, you you the things that we in our busy, in our previously busy, busy lifestyle, you know, you forget to teach your child, please and thank you. Uh, kids are growing up in a society, in a, uh, you know, when they use text speak, sometimes text speak means you don't even say please and thank you because you're doing it in text. You know, this is the real moment where we need to begin to reinvest in those core values. You know, this week, for example, here in the UK is anti-bullying week. And one of the things that, one of the themes that we're running with this week is about odd socks. We're encouraging young people, even right from the age of five, to spend all of this week wearing odd socks. And that's really about teaching young people about diversity and difference, that it's okay to have odd socks. Odd socks make a pretty picture because sometimes we've grown up with this uh, mentality that we all should look and feel the same. And it's that that's what causes young people as they grow older to lose respect for diversity, to, to be threatened by difference. And that's where you see the increase in bullying. Right now, statistics tells us that at least one in two young people experience bullying, and at least one in four attempts or contemplate ending their own life as a result. Now, these are children in our society. Something's costing this. Something has led to the increase where we are unable to um, resolve conflicts, where we, where we are threatened because someone, I'm, I've got brown hair, someone has blue hair, therefore I'm threatened by that. We have an opportunity to press that reset button. We have an opportunity to build compassionate young people by teaching those core values of kindness, um, love, listening, sharing, just those things that we maybe in our busy lifestyle we've, we've um, neglected. The other thing that's critical for this moment is relationships. It's so vital that whilst our young people are missing out on the connections they have with their friends, you know, those um, regular check-ins that happens in the classroom or just by meeting somebody on the tube or on the train and just a hi, how are you? A lot of young people are missing out on that. We need to double down on connections because I know that connections and relationship helps build that, be that sense of belongingness, that sense of stability, which is in this whole uncertainty that we have, we need some form of stability. Con relationships are vital. So for me, the two things that I feel as parents or caregivers right now that we need to invest in is really doubling down on that those core values and doubling down on making sure that our children or our young people have access to good relationships. And it might be relation. Sadly, I know that not every child has that. Sadly, I know that sometimes children have come from chaotic backgrounds, there isn't that um, relationships in their life. Let's look out for ways that we can supplement on that because relationships are so, so vital at this stage. 
Great, that's so true. And Catherine, along those lines, how can we help our children make connections? Um, especially, I'm thinking about winter, which I am dreading. Um, the shorter days, the worse weather. I've made sure the kids have a lot of warm clothes because I'm just going to have them outside as much as possible, but they won't be out as much as they have been. Mm -hmm. So how can we help them, like Tessie said, make those connections and, and sort of grow their empathy and, and their relationships even as they are sort of so sequestered right now? Well, this um, is something of technology because, you know, for very little people, there are apps like Caribou where as a grandparent, you can literally play a game with your grandchild, you know, wherever they are. I think what we want to create for young children, especially, but it's really true for all children of all ages, are regularly scheduled play dates, just like we would at home. So they know on Wednesday afternoon at three, and even if they're just doing parallel play, even if your child, actually, this is a really good thing, is sitting on their bed, doing their homework, and their classmate is doing the exact same thing. That is not bad. That's a sense of creature comfort and connection. So you want to create regular scheduled events with their friends, with family, extended family, you know, the quarantine for kids kind of thing. Um, and you want to also make sure that as a family, you yourself are having fun. And it could be fun gaming together, but also- Must you have fun. <laughs> have fun all fine too. You know, Friday night in our family when our kids were growing up were pizza and a movie night. Now, whoever's turn it was, they got to pick the movie. Um, and there are ways, and the other thing that we also know, and this sort of piggybacks on what Tessie was saying, when kids are feeling isolated or they're feeling disconnected or they're feeling depressed and anxious because of the pandemic, hands down, one of the best ways to help them is to set them up in some kind of screen-based pen pal relationship. So a 10-year-old can read to a four-year-old or to an elder person or to become a pen pal of sorts, literally. We can all, you know, middle school kids can tutor elementary school kids, high school kids can teach English as a second language or Spanish as your second language or whatever. But when we get in helping relationships, we increase our own empathy. We feel like we matter and everybody needs to feel like they socially matter and are contributing. And one of the things we know about helping other people when you're feeling down is it's a great dopamine hit. You feel better. So, you know, there are so many things you can do. Being part of a learning group, guitar, Japanese, <laughs> you know, connects with the people who share your interests. Um, I'm taking amazing, hard to believe, but figure drawing classes online. You know, you used to have to show up and see the model. It's great. So for everybody also to find something that you want to learn together with somebody else is a beautiful thing. Book clubs online, but you have to schedule it for your kids mm. and really help them feel in control. One of the things that we really want to focus on are what are the things you can control right now? And you can control some of your social connections. And that's sort of the proactive response, you know, to right. make. Great, yeah, and along those lines, Pat, what tips do you have? Um, Fortnite bores me, <laughs> I have to say it. I find it so boring, but that's what my boys wanna to talk to me about. And so I know that probably a great way to connect with them would be to have them teach me how to play it. So can you talk about that a little bit? What tips do you have for parents you know, with these dark days of winter coming, uh, how can they make those connections? And like Catherine and, and as we said, how can they um, connect with their kids maybe over video games in a positive way? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of different games uh, for obviously all different stripes. Uh, there are puzzle games. We know women love puzzle games and, you know, it, there, there are lots of games out there. Among Us is a very, very popular game right now. I know a lot of parents who are playing Among Us with their kids. Um, so it doesn't have to be Fortnite. It could be something else. Uh, but there are, you know, great games that, that families can play together. Um, you know, the Nintendo Switch is selling through the roof. Um, Animal Crossing is a very popular title that a lot of families are playing together. So I, I think playing together is, is, is a great way to um, spend not just the winter months, but, you know, all year round. Um, but, you know, look, I think um, 
uh, there, it's come up several times so far today, you know, building trust with kids is really important. Um, and, you know, we have found in our research for, for many years is, is that, you know, when the kids are, you know, lower than the teenage years, but, you know, preteen and younger, parents do have tighter reins and there it's important to begin to loosen those reins and most parents do um, as the child ages and um, you know you teach your kid to look both ways when you cross the street you know there are certainly rules of the road online things like if you're playing a game and somebody asks you to leave the game and go into a different server or, or meet in another platform or, or room. That's just absolutely all parents should have a rule that no, forget about it. Um, but it's teaching kids how to take responsibility um, for themselves and, and building this resilience that we're all talking about today. Um, I think it's really important. And, and as I started my, my remarks, you know, the first question you asked me, Amy, you know, relax, make sure that the games are fun and not stigmatized. Oh, you're playing video games again, or oh, you know, can't you just put that controller down? Or, you know, there's a rhythm to playing video games. If you're in a competition and, you know, dinner, it's, you, you're calling dinner and your child's in the middle of a match, respect that because for your child to leave that match, they're letting down their playmates, you know, their team, you know, team, team is going to be really upset that they're pulling out mid match. It, it, there's a certain rhythm to it. And I think it's important for parents to appreciate that as well. Um, so that's, that's great. And Lenore, uh, along those lines, how do we not, how do we loosen the reins without loosening them, loosening them in a way where they are just on screens, you know, playing a game for eight hours. Um, and, yeah. How do we let them thrive um, as we loosen these screens and in, in the right direction? <laughs> You know, I was on another um, one of these webinars, and I thought that the the lady uh, had the best in, uh, suggestion, which is that it is it is hard to suddenly say, "Okay, it's dinner time," or "Oh my God, you've been on that thing forever. Would you please get off already?" And it becomes this contest of wills. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was a woman named Audrey Monk, who who used to be a camp counselor and then a camp. Um, director. And she said, just have a schedule during the day where it's always at, you know, outdoor time from four to five, or it's outdoor time on the weekends from one to three. And then it's not you suddenly saying it's time to get off, or I can't stand it anymore. Oh my God, Fortnite, 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 please leave. Mm -hmm. And um, that way, also, they won't be getting into a match right before they're supposed to be going outside because they know that outdoor time is coming. I thought that was really interesting, um, Pat, about the idea of th that they won't want to let down their friends in the middle of a match if they pull out because it's dinner time. But if they know that something is coming up, then they can plan for that. So I would say, um, you know, just build in some time that isn't on the screen, that isn't you suddenly deciding that you've had enough. And that seems very helpful. And I was going to give one really hopeful story about empathy and video games, if I could. Um, so uh, my friend Barbara uh, has two sons, they are 15 and 19. And in the real world, they don't play together. You know, it's too big an age gap, even when they were growing up, but online they do. And at one point, the 15 year old said, oh, um, you know, there's this $20 upgrade that I can get for free if everybody votes to put me on the team. So I'm just going to ask to, you know, for everybody to vote for me and that'll be $20 saved. And his older brother said, don't do it. Don't do it. And he's like, why not? He said, nobody likes you. Like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, you're, all, you're always killing people when you don't have to and you're butting in and you talk too much. And so the 15 year old so said, what, what should I do? And he said, well, you know, only kill when you must and don't trash talk the whatever it was that he gave. He gave some um, practical suggestion for how to be a better player. And therefore it was absorbed by the 15 year old, but it was really advice on how to be a better friend, how to be a better person. And because it was taken as a game hack, as opposed to a, you know, nobody likes you, you're a jerk. It was much easier for the 15 year old to absorb and he did modify his behavior and he was voted onto the team. 
And so the idea that all, all they're doing is shooting, killing, and swearing online is not true. And it's actually, it's just like the playground. If you're a jerk, nobody wants to play with you. So you start modifying your behavior. That's why we believe in play. That's why I believe in mixed age play. And here it is online. So there's a lot of good that can come from it. And, and I'd just like to follow up on that one point. Every game has community guidelines. Every online multiplayer game has community guidelines. And I think it's important for kids with their parents to read through those community guidelines. Um, and, and by the way, game publishers do try to enforce those community guidelines. So if you're acting in a way that's not compliant with the community guidelines, you may risk you know, penalties or, or you know, timeouts or, or other types of, of um, you know, actions or sanctions if, if you aren't compliant with those community guidelines. So the community guidelines are actually a good teaching tool. That's amazing. And this is, frankly, it's it's waking me up a little bit because I have been very strict about screen time and I have pulled them off of games because it was dinner time or I have made them stop playing with their friends at a certain time because it's bedtime. And, um, you know, there was an argument last night because one kid always kills people when, you know, he's supposed to be part of the team. So it's really interesting to see, you know, instead of me as a parent, but just seeing this whole thing as like, this is their whole life right now. And ways we can find how to build their empathy and their compassion through this situation. That was a, a great story, Lenore. Tessie, what do you think about all of this? How do we put this into play and help our children thrive just like Lenore and, and Pat were talking about? Do you know, I love the example that Lena has just given because that example kind of encapsulates exactly some of our approach at the Diana Ward. We, we run all of our programs on the basis that young people have to be at the center of creating the change that we want to see in society. So we run an anti-bullying program and what we actually do is we, um, the, camp the program really does three things. Firstly, it, tack it helps tackle bullying both on and offline. Um, secondly, it, it really looks at beyond the one in two young people who experience bullying, it really looks at the whole school, the whole community, that collective effort. But thirdly, and most importantly, it places young people at the heart of tackling it. And why do we do that? Firstly, we know that young people, um, young people are critical. They have the right vernacular to act as peer educators. So that example of you, someone, edu you know, it's not you as a parent coming in to say, this is what you must do. But young people have the right vernacular. They, they know how to, how to teach you the right thing as long as they know better. And that's why it's important to A, teach a young person, but then get them to become that role model that, try, um, that teaches the next. So firstly, young people, uh, part of our program looks at young people as prevent, preventers because they have the right, the right vernacular. Secondly, they're involved in intervention. And that's because young people understand peer group dynamics and therefore they play a critical role in conflict resolution and mediation. You know, sometimes when things get, when things aren't treated early enough, they escalate. That escalation is what makes it worse. The escalation is what brings the problem online. It becomes a whole different problem because moms, parents get involved. It's much, much bigger. What you need to do is teach young people to act as mediators. How do we empower them? How do we give them the tools to become mediators? The third bit is the support function. You know, statistics show that young people seek validation from their own peers. Also that young people are much more likely to speak to a peer about a problem before they speak to an adult. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what do you do? How do we, when you know all of this, how do you then begin to look at how do we empower young people to act as, to take a leadership role in tackling some of the issues that they face? And that's the model that we use at the Diana Award. We train young people to become anti-bullying ambassadors. And what we do is then send them back into their schools to become the team that helps keep their schools safe. And it's simple because that these three things have explained the prevention, the intervention, and the support is the function of anti-bullying ambassadors. But we can also take that peer-led approach or that youth-led approach. We can apply that to all of various other social issues. 
if you look around, when we think about environmental issues, you just need to look at who are the key players when it comes to, you know, really speaking out about env the environment. Lots of young people. Just replicate that model. And I think this is where our society sometimes, whilst we get bogged down with our young people are spending too much time online, our young people are doing this, actually, what are they learning? How do we build those innovative skills that they're learning how do we how do we empower them to use those skills to create the social change that we want to see and i think that's where sometimes we miss it because we're so focused on maybe the minutiae or the things they're not doing now don't get me wrong i know that we have everything has to be placed within good boundaries they had like all the parental controls everything that we've said already is important but i think sometimes we place so much more emphasis on that and we treat the internet as a, this world wide web this dangerous place and we're not building on the good, the incredible good that young people are learning we're not harnessing that power of good to replicate that across society. Wonderful, that is so great to hear. And it's it, it's sort of empowering to hear that as a parent, frankly, and hopefully for the, the children that we can teach that to. Catherine, what do you think about everything that's tes that Tessie is saying? It is interesting because you, um, when kids are in school, you know that their peers are sort of keeping them in line socially and, you know, or, reining them in when things are going awry or you know if if a child is bullying another sometimes it's their peers who will pull them back or let them realize what's wrong so how are we handling that now when we are so um self-contained at home mm -hmm. and and what do you think about everything that tessie was saying as far as children and their their minds well i guess one of the things i think is that um, schools really need to think what belongs in the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. you know, what is the heart of the matter for children today? And, you know, I, I certainly have profound respect for everything teachers are doing because I've been doing a lot of teacher support and they are experiencing this pandemic in ways that are so crushing when they have children at home and they're trying to teach at the same time. But what I see teachers doing more of in the pandemic, actually, that I think should be more of the through line of education period is that they're teaching more SEL, they're paying more attention to actually connecting to kids on school, making sure you, every child, you're making contact, you're having a little conversation with every kid in your math class. Or, and in advisory, they're really doing a lot more um, sharing of, of their dilemmas, sharing how they're feeling and problem solving with each other. And you know, in the report, we heard about how set ages seven to 11 are so important for sort of front end learning, if you will, around technology. 10, 11, 12 middle school is a time where we really want to give kids more practice and more tools in how to respond empathically, how to be an upstander, how to really respect identities and have the language and the skills to not just know what it means to be an anti-racist, but really to take the courageous step of speaking up. And what we know is that if children are going to do this, they need to practice, practice, practice. And what I love about what happens online is that kids are practicing more today online. And I guess what I'd love to see is um, just as we, you know, we value what we teach kids in school by how much real estate we give it in the calendar or the weekly schedule. And I would love to see all schools have a K through 12th grade or whatever your system is core course that meets as often as math, science, English, et cetera. On um, these skills, tech, citizenship, tech, health and well-being, DEI competencies, SEL competencies, ethics, global awareness, consciousness, environmental concern. But most of all, where kids get to practice with other kids, how to have these conversations. Because what we know about primary prevention is if you, kids often don't have the language right off the bat. Think how many times you're in the shower and you're trying to think of, well, I wish I had said something. I wish I had stood up. I wish I had pointed out that that man took so much airtime and that woman get, didn't get to speak, right? So we want to have kids practicing. And I, you know, I think that the more we can create context like that on screen, I think, Testy, what you're absolutely right. One of the other things we know about primary prevention and just sort of mental health and well-being is the more you are in a peer mentoring situation where you are actually teaching little kids the thing you want the older kids to be learning, the more it goes into their core consciousness. 
Mm -hmm. So I love the design of what you're doing, Tessie. And I, and I think that um, we need to bring more of that into children's lives. And during the pandemic, I think, you know, going back to being a peer mentor online is a beautiful thing to be. Being in a support group online is a wonderful thing to be. Um, reaching out to people and helping them right. is really important. Right. So Pat, Lenore, Tessie, along those lines, um, and, and sort of going back to what this theme seems to be is, how do we practice this at home? Um, specifically, Tessie, do you have, you know, one or two tips, if you could tell any parent how to practice this at home, um, because honestly, the silver lining of this time is we are here and we can connect with our children and help teach values and help them learn. So what would your one or two best tips be for parents? And then Pat, Lenore, I'd love to hear from you both as well. No, absolutely. Uh, My first key to any parent, firstly, is you can't build resilience through avoidance. Right. <laughs> It's not going to happen. Resilience is built through experience rather than learn. Just create opportunities to experience new stuff with your child. If you don't know what to do, sit with them, ask them. I remember when lockdown first happened for us here. I mean, my, I've got two children. They're 22 and 20, so they're not really kids anymore, but they're still my kids. Um, and when lockdown first happened and they all came back home from university and we were at home together, now, I never had a TikTok account. I'm not really, I'm good on all of my socials, but I didn't really think TikTok was for me. But I could see that my kids were always on TikTok and I could see them giggling all the time about all these accounts. I set up one and they were, they were mortified at the thought of me being on TikTok. <laughs> But I began to invite them because I wanted to learn more about TikTok, but I was so embarrassed to ask them to teach me. I just began to say, look, let's do some videos. And we began to do videos together. And it just became a whole new experience that, you know, they're older. They don't really, you know, they're all in their own rooms. I don't, they don't need to do stuff with me. But it became something we did together as a family. And we did a weekly TikTok video as a family. And it was hilarious. Like, please do not go and check it. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my, my real advice is, is, you know, you can't build resilience through avoidance. It has to be through, through, um, through experience. But it has to be in a, an open way, in a way that allows people to, to make mistakes, but also to reflect. You reflect together. You think, oh, that that's, you know, that's one of the things we did. That, that TikTok was in great. What did I do wrong? How can we make it better? It's the experience, the reflection. That's how we build resilience. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I, I have that. to I have to jump in and say that's going to be my phrase. I actually wrote it down on a piece of paper in front of me that you can't build resilience through avoidance. Totally agree. And my suggestion for parents for kids, how do you build resilience? You let kids do new things that they haven't done before on their own. If they haven't cooked dinner for you, they're going to cook a dinner. If they haven't learned how to ride a bike, now is the time. If they haven't climbed a tree, now is the time. And that is something that Let Grow, my organization, has been pushing all along, pre-COVID, during COVID, it's gonna be the same after COVID. When kids do things on their own, it is so great for the resilience because they're not gonna necessarily know how to do it. They're not necessarily going to do it right. It might be a little frightening. Anything new is hard and give them this chance to do it. And I have to put in a plug because it's free for our Let Grow independence kit it's a list of ideas of things that kids can do from you know from zero to well probably not zero but from maybe ages five to age 12 or 13 things that they can do on their own you let them go you get to see just how independent and resilient they can be and it changes your outlook on them and it changes their outlook on themselves and some of it will be online and a lot of it will be offline and it's it's a time for that rich experience even though we're at home even though we're in a pandemic. So let your kids do something independently and you will be amazed. Love that. And Pat, how about you? One yeah, big tip. I would, I would reiterate what's already been said. I mean, I think two words for me come to mind, which is engage and empower. I think part of the building the trust um, with your kids is to empower them and, you know, they're going to make mistakes. Um, so do we as parents. Um, 
I, I just think it's really important to, instead of thinking about online safety as things that I'm going to stop my child from doing, think about it more as um, let's engage in the experience. Let's see, you know, what sort of um, benefits there are, emphasize the benefits, discuss the risks, as don't, don't ignore them, but, but make sure that, you know, your child is, uh, that you're listening and that your child feels comfortable engaging with you in, a, in an open sort of positive way. Um, also, I'd like to give a little plug to a website that we built uh, called parentaltools.org. You know, the research indicates parents want a one-stop shop. We did that for game devices. Um, parentaltools.org is a great place to just uh, ingest really easy to understand instructions on how to set up parental controls and what the, what the particular device in your home may provide you as a parent in terms of uh, specific controls for specific purposes. So just a, a little plug for that. That's great. And Catherine, one parting word, and then I think we get to move on to some, some Q&A here. Um, I guess the three words, if I can, that come to my Please mind. <laughs> Um, be really curious. Support mm -hmm. your kids autonomy. We know that kids learn the best when they feel their parents support their independent learning, not when their parents are helicopter parenting or over-involved or passing anxiety on. So be curious. How do you do that? How do you think of that? Wow, where'd you come up with that idea? That is so cool. No judgment, curiosity. The next one is stay connected. Stay connected through connecting with what they're doing online, but most of all, stay connected to your kids because they need you. They need to feel seen, safe, secure, and soothed during traumatic times by their caregiver. Seen, safe, soothed, and secure. Those are the four S's. Dan Siegel, Tina Payne Bryce's research. And the last thing that I would say is stay calm. We know that in a crisis, the more we can self-regulate and stay calm and stay optimistic, the better the people we love and live with and are connected to will do as well. Lovely, well, thank you all. Hang in there, we're gonna have some uh, Q and A's from the audience here. Um, in addition to that, we have a poll question. And the question was, what is the best approach to teaching healthy media consumption? Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like so far, 64% um, of the people who answered it said it's families sharing online experiences together. So that goes right back to our conversation we've been having. Next up would be 25% who said the rules and restrictions on content and screen time, okay? And then just 11% said giving kids independence and autonomy. So that's the poll for today. We have a few questions here. Uh, first one, can you address the pressures of at-home education on families living in poverty and from underrepresented groups? Tessie, that seems like exactly what you're working on. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, no, absolutely. So one interestingly, when COVID first, when we first had lockdown in the UK in March, we we sent so we did a poll asking um, young people to tell us their top five concerns. A couple of those concerns were issues around family relationship breakdown, but also the lack of access to education, the loss of skills. We did a couple of things at the time. We, we, we lobbied the government to make sure that people who needed it had um, access to laptops. Um, we knew as well at the time that the government did say to schools to remain open for, care, um, for families of care workers. But also that meant that, you know, if you're looking at most people from lower, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they're probably not going to go in they're, because maybe, th you know, maybe there's chaos at home. No one would even bother asking that kid to go in. And so we, it just meant that we needed to work harder as society because the truth is society is deeply unequal. We just can't ignore that there's a debt with this, this crisis would has, has, has heightened um, the inequalities that we already know. There will be huge inequalities in education. And this is where we come back. For us, what we decided to do, having lobbied the government for, for laptops, but we knew that not everyone was getting it, we doubled down on relationships. We decided to 
open up our books and, and call for many more mentors. We needed people, people like me and you, people who just had a little bit of time, who could give an hour. Last month, we ran a campaign that's called 111, and it was simply one hour, one young person, one adult. Give a young person an hour a week of your time, that's all. And that's what we need to do to really build back up that inequality or that equity that young people are missing out on. And really, my encouragement would be, this is, you know, I always have this, I believe in what is called the village mentality. It takes an entire village to raise a child. We need to look beyond ourselves. Look, our kids might be fine. Our kids might have all the equipment they need, the laptop. They would get on. Not every child has this. We need to look outside of ourselves and make sure that no one's left behind. Can I ask a question there? I mean, I like the idea of giving an hour to, you know, a kid or a couple of kids. And I have no idea where I go to do that. So what we did, we actually facilitate, we asked people, we asked adults to register with us who wanted to be involved. We also asked young people to get, to register. And we did all of the matching. We did the pair. We made sure the adults were screened and trained. And we did all of that. Now, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to explore with you guys, maybe through FOSI, how we can facilitate this. But one of the things we did, we, I know we had people from outside of the UK that um, registered. And whilst we couldn't support if, were, if, if it was outside of the UK, what we encouraged was, look, go to a local library, speak to a local school. They have information on the kids who are being left behind. You know, let's just, just reach out a little bit. I'm sure within the schools, they would know that XY kids are actually struggling and mm -hmm. would welcome the opportunity of having a mentor. Cool, thanks. Great. And it looks like we have time for one last question. Um, okay, and this is very uh, similar to what we were just talking about, but the online activities are all wonderful, but what do you suggest for families that live in digital and online poverty? Hmm. So parents who feel that their children don't have the opportunities, don't have the online ability to connect with friends, with family, with um, teachers, what suggestions do you all have and how to help them? And I like the idea of going to your local schools. Um, I know in Washington, D.C., if you go to your school, they do have options for people to help. But I think, you know, and it starts in very local communities. But what advice would anyone else here have? I don't know. I think my library does a lot. I think if you go there, they do have I think they can lend you, um, you know, technology, and and there's still people there, like good old librarians who you right. can talk to. Right, right. And I know Washington D.C. public schools have laptops for kids and um, are are getting MiFi and and access to the internet, but it's a struggle. It is a struggle. Yeah. It's at, just as Tessie said, it's sort of highlighting how um, the gap. And that's, you know, and that's I. Just to jump in again, I do think that this is a time where we need to work extra hard to find, because sadly, the demography we're talking about will not be the ones to raise their hands up to say, fine. You can't see it, <laughs> right? If they're not online, you can't see them. Yeah, exactly. And there is something, there is digital poverty is real, you know, and we just, I think tech companies, I think, again, this comes back to that village mentality. We just all need to reach out. And it might be that even within our, our children, they might know within their friendship group what child isn't always online. And maybe that's where as a family, you can think, do you know what, we're gonna gift that child in the most discreet way. Maybe it's a birthday or for Thanksgiving. How can we support that family? And I think we just need to be creative and really go outside of the box here. Right, and what a great way to, to, to show our children how to be connected to their, their community as well. Well, our time is up. Thank you all very much. Uh, this was great. I learned a lot um, and I'm looking forward to, to moving on with a lot of the advice and, and insight you all gave to me as well. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. This is fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I want to add my thanks, Amy, to you and all of the panelists for that wonderful conversation. Um, you know, you can't build resilience through avoidance. Um, and the opposite of avoidance 
is engagement. Uh, and I think that was something that all of you talked about, uh, whether you know, it's getting involved in your kids' online lives, uh, the games that they play, whatever. And while doing it, uh, make sure to model good digital parenting whenever you can.